morning. How's everyone today? Blessed. Amen. If you have your Bibles, open to the book of Galatians, chapter number 2 and verse number 11. Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 11. I'd like to welcome you all into the house of God today. I'm so excited you've chosen to be here. I'm always excited about what God is going to do, and uh, I'm also glad that he's not really good at, at surprises, you know. Um, I know I like to set up surprises. I'm just not very good at it because I'm the kind of person that would think about something to buy my wife and think of a nice gift to get her and be all excited about having found the right thing and, and go to all the trouble to get it really far ahead in advance of time and get it and wrap it up and put it under the tree and then tell her what it is. I'm just excited. I'm glad that God's like that. God doesn't say, hey, wait, wait five more minutes or 20 more minutes or 30 more minutes and then I'll show up and I'm just glad he starts right away. Amen? Brother Joe steps up here and just starts talking and you feel the presence of God starts centering. Just talking about the announcements and what's going on in the church and you realize the life and the vitality of the church and just that opening prayer and, and just where it starts right there and then the music comes in and God blesses through that music and it's just amazing. I'm just glad he's no good at, at holding back. Amen. Aren't you glad to serve a God who's no good at holding back? No good at surprises. I'm glad he likes to spoil the ending. Right? I'm glad he's a God who just loves us so much he's excited to see us. Right? Um, if, if you have your Bibles again, Galatians chapter 2. We read the first few verses last time of, of, chapter, of chapter 2. And, and God is calling us out. God is calling us out through this passage that, that Paul is writing to the church at Galatia. He's writing to this church and saying to them... Why, why be something that you're not? He's talking about how we fake our way through life. We fake our way through the Christian life. And people come to me all the time because I have the chance to speak at a few churches and, and help out with churches, kind of uh, trying to help them to see what God's up to in their lives and where God is, is heading them and help them to see the right next move and trying to help steer in that direction. And people say, why is our church not working? Because we seem to have these right goals. And the marketing scheme answer is that we need the right vision statement. And I've been in corporate America a long time, and let me tell you that I agree with the idea that vision is important. The Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish. But a vision statement and a vision are two different things. The difference is a cool lettering that's up on the wall is a vision statement, right? When it comes off the wall and into our heart, it's a vision. Do you understand the difference? A vision statement lives up there. It lives on a plaque. It lives on one of those little cards on your, on your desk. Right? My dad used to have uh, several of those that would, you know, would say things. He had a little, a little thing on his desk, a little wooden circle that said to it on it. Yeah, he, in case he needed to get around to it, that's what it was. He had a round to it right there. Somebody needed it. I'll get around to it. He said, here you go. He also had a little statue on the corner of his desk that said somebody should invent a desk that flushes. I don't know why that always stuck with me, but it's just good stuff, right? But it's a, it's a mantra. It's just a little chance, just a little idea, and we get behind it, and we have this vision statement, and look at us. We have a vision statement. Now, sometimes we get all spiritual and call it a mission statement. We've got a mission statement. Listen, I'm excited that you have a mission statement, but not nearly as excited as I'll be when you actually are on mission. When it comes off of the paper and is in our heart. How do we know when it's in our heart? How do we know when the vision is in our heart? It comes out. You see, God didn't build our heart as a container. This is one of the great misunderstandings about how God created us. When God designed our soul, when God designed our heart, it is designed to leak. We are so careful to guard our heart and hide our heart and protect our heart. And God is saying, you are missing the point of a heart. I don't want you to have amazing love inside your heart. I want you to have amazing love in your hands. I want you to have amazing love in your feet. I want you to have amazing love in your mouth, in your hugs, walking with people and talking with them. Amen? We put a picture in the bulletin. We're going to help the elderly. And that picture, no offense, doesn't help them at all. Do you know what actually helps them? When we make the picture. In other words, when someone takes a picture of us doing whatever it is it says we're doing. Amen? 
We're praying for our schools. That's awesome. Now go to your school and pray there. They won't let me in. Walk around it. And man, they wouldn't let the children of Israel in Jericho. We saw how that turned out. You've gone to jail for worse things. <laughs> Approach slowly with your hands visible, I'm just saying. <laughs> just don't get too close, right? Drive circles around it. What I'm saying is, the world looks at the church and says, you're a bunch of hypocrites, which ironically makes them hypocrites, okay? I get it, I get it. But the problem with them, their claim that the church is filled with hypocrites is the validity of the claim. Because we're so good at saying what we should do, and we're so good at getting fired up about what we should do, and we're always worried about what they are doing and how those people should stop doing that stuff and some other people should start doing the good stuff. That we forget that we is they, and they is, is us and. This is when I wish I was preaching to a bilingual congregation that someone had to translate that. <laughs> That's when the translator would be like this. He'd be like. Right? <laughs> but you know what I mean. The they that are so evil, uh, that's us. That, that's us. No, we're not like those people. You just proved it. When you said you're not like those people, you just proved that you are, in fact, those people. And those people who should be doing something good, those people who should go out there and do that thing, those people who should protest that thing, and those people who should go and serve, that's you. Don't we have people at church who do that? Yes, they're called members. I thought we had a committee, yes, to tell the members what they're supposed to do. Amen? Oh, my. Quit talking. You want me to move on? Next point. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Not today. What I'm trying to get at is that we're so good at coming up with words. And we fail so miserably at turning words into actions. What Jesus believed, and I hope it's okay. Is that an okay reference? Okay, cool. That's all I got, man. All I got is Jesus, so I hope it's okay. What Jesus believed was in showing love. What Jesus believed is that, well, I'll just quote him. This is how they will know that you are my disciples when you have love one for another. Jesus said, you know what you guys did for me? You clothed me and you fed me and you took me in. They said, when did we ever do this? When you did it unto the least of these, my brethren, my brothers, my sisters, my children. When you take care of other people. Amen? There's a, a ministry called Seven Bridges to Recovery. Seven Bridges works on downtown underneath the, uh, the underpasses. And if you've driven through the downtown connector, you look up under the underpasses, there's homeless folks who live up under there. Some of them live there in misery. Some of them are very happy to live there. Uh, that's exactly where they want to be, doing exactly what they want. But nonetheless, it's a great opportunity. When you say, boy, we should do something about the homeless population in Atlanta, that sounds like a bullet point on the mayor's platform. But when you say, I'm going to get a bunch of stuff that I'm not wearing anymore, and I'm going to go down there, and I'm going to walk up to actual homeless people, and I'm going to give them not only food, and not only water, and not only a little love and affection and, and some caring, but I'm going to actually give them peace in my heart and some of my time, that's the difference. Amen? Amen? Churches are always concerned about, about uh, abortion uh, options, what are, what are the alternatives that we can do? We have a place that we're affiliated with. This church is involved with, and I thank God. That is saying, not only do we believe it, but we're going to do something about it. When you look around this church, you see ministry after ministry for people who say, not only do I believe this, but I want to put it in action. And that is where this church can differentiate itself, where it is doing some of those things. My point isn't that we're not doing anything the right way. That's not it at all. This church, above many others, is doing tons of great stuff. My, my call today is that all of us would recognize that every one of us is being called to participate in life. God has a reason for your existing. He has a purpose and a plan for your life. And that plan is to glorify him in how you live. Paul's not a word mincer. Let's look at this. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11. 
Paul is talking. And if you remember from last time, Paul had been called on the carpet. He'd been called up to Jerusalem to the home office to report on why he's offering the gospel to all these Gentiles, these non-Jews. And Paul said, well, let me explain why I'm doing what I'm doing, because Jesus said so. Amen? God said to do this, and he's God and I'm not. So I did what he said. Verse 11, though, now the tables turn because now he runs into Peter in, in, in his own territory. He says, now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. <laughs> Write that in the Bible. I mean, we've all felt that before, right? Well, I know who the problem is. Some of you are even thinking about it now. Well, this church isn't where it ought to be because of old so-and-so. Run old so-and-so off and <laughs> we'll just see what happens. Probably the old so-and-so that needs to be run off isn't the person you're pointing at, but the person pointing. That's another sermon for another day. No extra charge for that nugget. I'll get there. But here's the message. Right there in the word of God, Paul calls out someone for a wrong belief. Now let me take a quick aside to talk about judgment. Because Christians have this weird mentality. It's this sort of passive-aggressive thing. We're supposed to inspect fruit, but not to judge. And I don't want to be judging people. That's bad, but I'm, I, I'm supposed to engage my culture. But I'm not supposed to judge my culture. I don't know what to do. So we get caught in this passive-aggressive kind of, hey, what you're doing is wrong, but I'm not supposed to say that. That means I'm wrong. Now I'm going to have to get over there with you. And the main reason we have this is because we've let politics become more important than the Bible. I had a Christian tell me the other day, well, I have concluded that there are a number of gray areas in the Bible, and I believe that I make my own judgment about those gray areas, and that's my freedom in Christ. Oh, that's awesome. Unfortunately, it's not biblical. I think that all those gray areas are in our heads. Because I find the Bible to be abundantly plain and clear. Does anyone have any question about what Paul is saying right here in this verse? Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. Gee, I wonder what he meant. Right? We get caught in this judgmental thing. Listen, and let me explain this. If you believe that sin is sin, that is not judgmental. Sin is sin because God called it sin. Now, let me explain something really important. Why does God call stuff sin? Why does, what's the point of labeling it sin? And this is extremely important. Please do not zone out and miss this. Why is God so consumed with labeling all of these dangerous behaviors, things that kill us, things that destroy us, things that wreck and ruin our life? Why is God so obsessed with calling them sin? You want to know why? Because he knows what to do with sin. Amen? The hardest part of going to the doctor's office is waiting. You get a test. Tests aren't the problem. What is the problem? test results I so want Star Trek to be real some cranky doctor walks up with some beebly bopper tricorder oh you've got a problem Beep, there it is that's not how it works but that'd be awesome not knowing is way harder than dealing with whatever it is I will tell you this I I am I, I I'm a pretty level-headed guy. I'm pretty easy going. I don't worry and stress about a lot of stuff. But there are those moments, and I'll, uh, some of you can relate to this. I feel confident in Christ. I believe that God is in total control of my life. I have no worries about it. He's protecting my wife and my children, and, and I'm good. But there are moments when I call my wife, and we talk about 964 times per day, text, email, phone calls, whatever, because I totally and completely love her. I'm just saying. It's just how, how we roll. In those middle of those 964 conversations, I'll call her one time and she won't answer. And even though I know where she is, 
and what she's doing, my mind immediately at light speed goes, an asteroid hit the house. <laughs> an airplane fell from the sky. This is my brain. This is what my brain is so fast, it's all of a sudden, I mean, in 30 seconds. Now, what happens in 30 seconds is she realizes that she was on the phone with her mom, and she saw that it beeped through that I was calling, and she hangs up with her mom, and she calls me back. But in those 30 seconds, I've envisioned the ending of my entire life. Now, it sounds silly, but some of you can nod with me, and you understand what I mean, that you can, you can go from perfectly happy to panic mode, boop, half a second. If there was a gold medal for that, I would win. God's promise to me was peace, right? So I have to take a deep breath and convert my fear, anxiety, and stress to God's perfect peace. Trust it. Amen? We get so caught up in our stress and anxieties and our worries and fears that we let them rule over us. And we're so worried about the political landscape that we have become impotent, powerless Christians. Because now we're told to engage society, but we're not allowed to call anything sin anymore. And what I want to remind you of is that my stress and anxiety and worry is a sin. And you might say, oh, that's the, no, everybody does that. Yes, everyone sins. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is a way in which I rob myself of the peace of God that he promises. And anything that robs me of the peace and the love and the, and the joy of Christ is sin. Missing the mark. Here's the mark, and I missed. That distance is called sin. How far off the mark I was. Now, first off, why does God have the mark? Because he knows how we work. And God's not-so-super-secret plan that he wrote down in the Bible for all of you to know is that he wants you to have an amazing life. He wants you to be filled with joy and happiness. He wants great things for your life. Will you go through hard times? Absolutely. But I will tell you, I've been happy without God, and I was miserable. And I've been miserable with God, and I was happy. Amen? Right? I'd rather go through the storms of life with God in my heart than all the happy days the world can contrive that are fake and going to end soon. I'd rather have the real thing. Amen? Amen? Like an all beef hot dog. We're going to the varsity. I can see that. I don't want a mystery dog. All beef, no mystery. Right? I like the real stuff. I don't know if the varsity is real stuff, but we can fake ourselves into believing it. I think it's funny that at the varsity they sell canned chili. I'm pretty sure that you should never open those cans. <laughs> it is not safe. Maybe you should be out of doors when you open those cans. I don't know. <laughs> but it's good when it's there. That's all I'm saying. Healthy, man, just awesome. What I'm saying is I'd rather have the real deal and have God in my life and face all the hard things that ever can come than to have an empty, fake, pretty-looking thing that crumbles at the first storm. Amen? The reason God calls it sin is because, number one, it destroys our life. It is the cancer that ruins everything. And avoiding sin isn't obeying God. Avoiding sin is helping myself to have the best life I can. Avoiding sin is selfish, which of course is a sin. So avoid it righteously somehow. What I'm trying to say is, God is not glorified by me not sinning. I don't make God greater through my lack of sin. God's greatness is implicit in who he is. It is the existence of God that makes him great. If I praise his holy name and I lift his name up on high and I live the most righteous life possible, God is not elevated one iota. 
And if I live the most wicked life imaginable and throw out the name of God and cast out the name of God and defeat and fight against God, God's great name is not diminished the tiniest bit. God's greatness does not derive from human beings. So when God calls sin, sin, he's not doing so because he's selfish or jealous in the human context, but because he's jealous for me. His love's like a hurricane, and I am a tree. Amen? He is jealous for me. He wants beauty in me. And if you know a parent and you look at that child, or better yet, a grandparent, and see the way they view that child. This is the desire of God. And he knows that sin is the shipwreck along the way. And all he's asking is to avoid the shipwreck, avoid the pain, and avoid the sorrow. When I was a little kid, I, I have a habit of trying to sit in the back seat. Somebody's in the car that's older than me or, or whatever, I try and defer and give them the, the front seat. And uh, this lady was with us, and I let her have the front seat. But I was in the back seat of a car that was not designed for actual human beings to sit in the back seat of. It's what my dad calls an insurance seat. You know, it's a four-seater for insurance purposes, but unless that person sitting in the back doesn't have legs, they're not going to be comfortable back there. Locking a car is a great idea. Can we agree with that? It's a good principle. You, when you get out of your car, you should lock your car. I hate that we have to, but you should. It's doing the right things. Closing your door when you get out of the car, those are good things to do. Those are the right courses of action, right? I'm in the back seat, and I go to get out of the car, and I cannot get out of the back of this car. I'm, I'm, really, I'm taking the car off is what I'm doing. I'm, I am, like, taking a shirt. But I reach up and put my hand on the pillar, to pull myself up. And when I put my hand on the pillar to, to, to pull up, this sweet lady shut the door on my hand. Yes, all four of the fingers. Not one of them, but all four of them. But the, the best part was the door was locked. And I'm trying as politely as I can to ask her to open the door. And she's looking at me and trying to explain that locked doors are good things and that closed doors are right things. And I'm trying to explain, I don't care. When she finally realizes it, she tries to open the door and it won't open because the door is locked. So she asks me to unlock it. My hand is in the door. In what possible universe could I unlock the door? We're trying to get the attention of the driver who's now scurried off from the car to come back and unlock the door and all the whole time my hands are crushed inside of this. Now, here's my point about sin. Would anyone say, hey, you know what? Y'all just go ahead. I'm cool. Anybody? I mean, my doors, my, my fingers, all four of my fingers are closed inside the door, okay? They're being crushed to death right now. The locked door, and I can't, I'm trying to, oh, I can't do anything. It looked kind of funny because it looked like I was trying to throw the car off of me. Because <laughs> I can't get out of the car because now my arm is pinched on it, and I can't, it's just a tiny little car. This is sin. It's a crushing pain in your life. And if she had said to me, I'm about to close the door, why don't you make a choice to move your hand? How foolish would I be to say to her, that's okay. I make my own choices. I do what I, can I get my head moving right? I do what I want to do when I want to do it how I want to do it. I demand the freedom to do what I want to do. And so she'd say, okay, smash. <laughs> How's that working out for you? It sounds silly, but I believe that it is theologically accurate to view sin as the stupid, painful things that we inflict on ourselves. We foolishly look at sin as some kind of restriction. I'm missing out on this. I'm missing out on that. I can't believe God won't let me do so and so. Yes, I can't believe God won't let me smash my fingers in the doors. Um, I'm pretty sure that means he loves you. 
Amen? I, I did get my fingers out of the door. I don't want anyone to be worried. It, I'm not actually still there. You can see me now. Okay? And my fingers do work. Uh, I mean, most of them. That, uh, just kidding. No, they're all, they're all good. They're all good. And, and, uh, and I got out of there, and the little lady was really sweet about it, although I'm not sure she ever understood exactly what happened. She was just wondering why a Baptist was dancing. <laughs> you sit and dance. <laughs> I don't want to, man, but I can't feel anything. We're so afraid to call sin, sin, because we think it's judgmental. Let me explain what judgmental is. Judgmental is when you call into question the character of a person because of something you think to be true. But it is absolutely not judgmental when you call sin, sin. Because the Bible declares it to be sin. Whether I say it is or isn't is irrelevant. I cannot make it a sin because I think that's right. I, I was raised in Georgia. I went to Six Flags in August, and I saw those poor ladies wearing culottes and denim skirts, and I thought, blessed be the name of the Lord. Somebody please tell them that it is not in the Bible that thou shalt perish in August at Six Flags. I know some of you are like that. Some of you might be here today. You have to think, we should go back to that. And listen, I'm not saying that shorts haven't gotten too short. Clearly they have. What I'm saying is when we make rules and call that the Bible, that's how we got in trouble to begin with. God has a principle. His principle is to dress appropriately. It is not about this hem of your skirt should be able to be curled in the fingers when in an upright position on your knees in the principal's office. That was a rule at my school. That's how long men's shorts had to be, and that's how long women's skirts had to be. And I'm thinking to myself, what lawyer wrote that rule? But that's how we view it. See, we view sin, we confuse sin and legalism. And that's how we got in trouble, church. That's how we blew it with the people around. That's how we lost credibility. Because we put men's rules on par with God's rules. And that's not true. Be decent. That's God's rule. Don't wear pants. That's a, that's a person rule. We shouldn't be afraid to call sin, sin, because if we don't call it sin, I have no cure for it. But if we label it as sin, I know exactly how to deal with it. I know exactly how to deal with it. Amen? Amen? This is why Jesus wants to call it sin, because number one, he wants to help you to understand that sin destroys your life, so stop it. And second, by calling it a sin, he's saying, hey, just so you know, I died for your sin. I died so that your sin could die. I died so I could take your sin and drag it to death. I died, we're reading in the, in the Word of Life Quiet Time right now, we're in... Uh, Colossians, and we just read this verse that my sin was nailed to his cross. Man, I just rejoiced reading that in the quiet time. I love the book of Colossians. So amazing. But that's where my sin was. My sin was nailed to his cross. That's why God is so concerned with calling it sin, because he's already paid the price for sin. Amen? We're so afraid of how the world looks at us that we don't want to be judgmental. Oh, that just sounds so horrible. What we want to be is tolerant. We should be tolerant. And I will remind you that this idea of tolerance is not a biblical principle. It is the antithesis of the word sin. Sin is that there is a standard, and sin is how far off of that standard I am. Tolerance is saying, well, that's close enough. Tolerance is acceptable error. How much acceptable error am I willing to have? A lot of times the difference between a $30,000 car and a $100,000 car is tolerance. The engineers are unwilling to accept a high tolerance. They demand a low tolerance. In other words, it's got to be even better than that, even sharper. A friend of mine is employed at Lockheed and he's in charge of their tests and measures. So when you put something on a scale there, he has to certify that that scale is accurate to a ridiculous amount of precision. 
It's an entire full-time job for a whole staff of people to make sure that all of their measuring tools are standardized, correct, and precise, and that they stay so. Why is that? Because it turns out in those high-performance aircraft, all those little microns matter. And that tolerance is how people die. Tolerance doesn't bring life. Tolerance brings death. We should never be afraid to call sin, sin. But if you judge a person because of their sin, if you say because of their sin they're worth less, then you've missed the point, and now you're outside of Scripture. If you begin to characterize someone as bad or evil because of sin, now we've missed the mark. It is the sin is the thing that we loathe. It is the sin that's the thing that we, that we hate and causes death. But it is the person whom we love no matter what. What if they despitefully use us? The Bible says to pray for those who despitefully use us. What if they are our enemies? The Bible says to love our enemies. Your personal prejudice is not a part of this. Your personal prejudice has no part in any of this. The Bible is the sole point of authority. Amen? That's the only thing that matters. We're, not af we're terrified to call something else a sin because we're afraid of sin in our own life. And what we want is we want to get away with all the sin we can. We're seeing pastors compromise on issue after issue after issue. Are they doing so because the Bible hasn't had a new revelation are they doing these, I've never read one where the guy said, I went to this verse that I never saw before, and it said all the stuff that I said was wrong in all the other chapters, in all the other books, I was just kidding. It's really okay. Now you found the magic verse. A verse that says all the other verses don't matter, this is the only verse that counts. I've never seen it, folks. But I've had them say I was reading a book by so-and-so. I was reading some articles online. I've been spending some time contemplating the idea. And I don't believe God really meant something he already said. It's the most dangerous statement in the world is when I anthropomorphize God. I just threw that out because it's a cool word. I just want to give people something to look up when they get at lunch. You know, like they're all Googling right now. Answer the more of us. I put God in man's shape. I think that God is like me. I want God out of heaven and on the earth with me, hanging out with me. And I want him to have emotions. And I, I want him to like some stuff and not like some stuff, you know. And I want him to do what I want him to do. I really, I really kind of don't want to anthropomorphize. I really want to turn him into kind of a puppet. That would be cool. I, want to, I just want to say, what God meant was this. <laughs> That's what we want. We want a God puppet. And we can use God's name to condemn people. And somehow, somehow in all of that condemning of other people, guess who we forget to condemn? Ourselves. And I know this is hard for some of you because some of you are perfect. And I get that. I'm probably talking to other people here today and not to you. Or I'm talking exactly to you, depending on how well you're listening. I want a human God that I can tell him what to do, and I can decide what he meant. In my life, I often say things, I'll, just as a small example, my daughter Molly is here with me today, whom I love. She's my sweet and precious little princess. I love her so much, but she will confess that there are times when I look her straight in the face and I say, Olivia, because I have five kids, and they move really fast. And they all have blonde hair and blue eyes, and I don't know which one is which. <laughs> and so she could say, my dad doesn't know who I am, which isn't true. She knows I know who she is. She knows that. I will confess in a moment of honesty that I was frustrated. I w there were three kids in my family. I have an older sister and a younger sister. I'm the only boy. To be called my sister's names <laughs> was pretty frustrating. And I promised I would never do that. <laughs> when I have children, I will never call them by their That's so silly. How can you do My 
my name is Mike and I have some sort of nomenclature dyslexia. I do not know which name belongs to which kid. I usually say things that I thought I'd never say that my dad said, do you know who I'm talking to? You know what I mean. My daughter couldn't stand in front of you and put her hand on the Bible and say my dad never gets the name wrong. She, she couldn't stand up here and put her hand in the Bible and say, my dad never loses his temper. My dad never gets frustrated. She couldn't say any of those things because they're not true. Amen? And what we want to do is we want God to come down to where we are, and we want him to say, come on, God, it's not really that bad, is it? I mean, look, 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 if I really love them, doesn't that change the rules? God, if I really want to do this, doesn't that make it okay? Hey, God, if a bunch of people think it's all right, doesn't that really make it okay? The majority rules, right, God? That's what we want. But sin isn't a rules negotiation. It's the foolishness that we believe that God set the sin rules up to keep us from having fun. And that's so the wrong thing to think. God set the sin rules up to prevent us from destroying our lives. Which, by the way, lets our life be the most fun that it can be. Amen? It turns out that when I stop, and this is, my dad always said this growing up, he said, uh, he hit his, hit his thumb with a hammer, he said, I hit my, my finger with a hammer because it feels so good when I stop. <laughs> and it's true. But I hope none of you need to go home and hit your finger with a hammer just so you can stop and think, wow, that's a lot better. But that's the foolishness of sin. That's what we think God's letting us miss out on. God, I can't believe you won't let me feel depressed. God, I can't believe you won't let me crush my soul. God, I can't believe you won't let me walk off that cliff. God, I can't believe you won't let me self-destruct. I can't believe you won't let me hurt myself. I can't believe you won't let me be miserable and in sorrow all the time. That's what we're saying. If we could learn to see it that way, oh, how different our lives would be. What does God want for you? I know the plans that I've made for you. They're plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans for your eventual good. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I can't imagine anyone listens to me talk for very long and doesn't realize this, but let me be clear. I am not in any way teaching some kind of ridiculous prosperity doctrine. Quite the opposite. I am telling you ahead of time exactly what Jesus said. Jesus said these words, In this world you will have tribulation. They hated me. They're going to hate you. So don't have any masquerading about what you think the Christian life is going to be like. You are in enemy territory. You are the alien and the stranger here. And people will judge you, even though you're not supposed to judge people. Apparently, they are free to judge whomever they want. It's just weird how that works out, isn't it? We should tolerate everybody except stupid Christians. We should let everyone have their right to free speech and do whatever they want, unless they're a stupid Christian. Is that not how it works? I'll repent if I'm wrong. I don't see it happening. You listen to the news, they can make fun of you. You can make fun of you. You can stand up on late night television and you can mock Christianity. And everyone laughs and it's fine. Stand, that, stand up and try that with any other denomination or any other faith. You'll lose your job. You'll get sued. Right? Right? We're so afraid of sin, and that means the devil wins. I'm not supposed to talk about sin. I've already broken the number one pastor rule, never stand in front of your church and talk about sin. It's not popular. It makes people feel bad. Then they should listen better. Amen? I'm telling you you have a sin problem. That's not, that's not the end of the story. I'm telling you the end of the story is not only do you have a sin problem, but God is the cure. Amen? That's how I wish it worked. You went to the doctor, he said, your knee's crooked. And he said, I got a knee crookedizer or de crookedizer. <laughs> Hold on, I'll be right back. Click, we're done. That'd be cool, wouldn't it? Oh, here's your problem right here. Thunk, you're better now. Hey. That's not how it works. The diagnosis has nothing to do with it. The diagnosis is a statement of reality. How foolish are we when we say things like, I don't want to go to the doctor because he might give me bad news. 
can I tell you an important secret? The doctor doesn't generate the news. The doctors do not create the diagnosis. You are whatever you are, whether he says it or she says it or not. But you're not going to fix it until somebody tells you what it is. I'm not afraid to talk about sin, because it's what we are, until we know Christ. Because I'm here to tell you the cure is Jesus. You believe that? The cure is Jesus. Now, you might wonder, how on earth does this have to do with that verse? Stay tuned. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. You see, our problem is we try to be so mealy-mouthed and get along with everyone. We're supposed to be all kumbaya Christians, and let's just all get along. And that is not the truth. Somebody, somebody needs to stand up and tell you that there are a lot of people out there that are talking about God and standing in godly-like places, but what they are saying has nothing to do with God. Somebody has to call them out. Well, I think you shouldn't judge other people. Are you listening at all? It's wrong because God said so. Verse number 12. For before certain men came from James, he, Peter, Peter would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. If no one was looking, Peter would kind of eat with everybody. But, but when he saw people that were there, he knew like certain people that were important in the church were there. He would say like, oh, yeah, let me just, uh, yeah, just gonna go right over here. That is hypocrisy. When my behavior changes based on who's around. When my ideology changes, my actions change based on the company. That is hypocrisy. It shows a lack of moral character. It shows a lack of integrity. I should be the same person in the light and in the dark. I should be the same person when everyone's watching me as when no one is watching me. Can I ask you a quick theological question? Are there ever times when no one is watching me? I think if God is in fact omnipresent, then God is always watching me, which shouldn't make me upset. It should give me great comfort. Amen? And remind us how silly it is that we don't want to tell God stuff in our prayers. Dude, I was there. Amen? All God needs for me to do is acknowledge that I know he was there. Because God, it turns out from the scriptures that God has a mountain of grace that he wants to pour on my molehill of sin. Isn't that cool? Where my sin abounded, his grace did much more abound. His grace drowned my sin, swallowed it whole. That's how he was. Verse number 13. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Hey, you know what's funny about hypocrisy? It turns out that it is contagious. If you want to ruin a church, just set the people against each other. It's not hard. Here, I'll do it. I'll show you a demonstration. We're going to change the color of the carpet to red. Have a nice day. That's all it takes. It's not anything important. It's not theologically important. All I had to do is say, these lights are going to be gone next week. Oh, who does he think he is? Well, I'll never come back in that place. Those are holy chandeliers. <laughs> Jesus himself may have manufactured those. Even though he was a carpenter, they might be made of wood. They are somehow sacred and holy, and if they're removed, the church will crumble. Seriously? I don't mean to be dramatic, but let me be plain with you. If tomorrow afternoon a tornado comes through here and destroys every beautiful building on this campus, it doesn't affect this church one iota. This church is not a building. It's certainly not carpet. And it's not chandeliers, and it's not paint colors, and it's not worship styles, and it's not altars or no altars. It's not Sunday school or connect groups or small groups or whatever. You know what it is? It is Jesus Christ and Christ alone. I have found that you can never be hypocritical 
when you've surrendered your heart to Christ. When you've surrendered your heart to Christ, let me explain what happens. All your wants and wishes are subdued, and all of his are elevated. When I'm surrendered to Christ, when I take back control, oh man, I can hippocrite with the best of them. I am telling you, I can talk about them people and those people and they ins and all, I can do it. All I have to do is tell God, hey, God, listen, thanks for being in charge of my life and getting me here, but I need you to move out of the way because I think I'm smarter than you and better than you. And I'm going to steer the ship, God, because I can see better and I can see farther and I know more. So I want to be in charge of my life and I want you to kind of just, if you could just leave me alone, that'd be great. That's what it means. That's what I am when I'm hypocritical. Verse number 14 but when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith faith in Jesus Christ, even as we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Hey guys, I'm glad you try to do good works, but they're not getting you into heaven. Well, I've done a lot of bad things and I want to make up for it by doing good things. Okay, stop. Your bad things are sin. And sin cannot be covered over by good things. And in case you're not following me, let me just explain that all of our righteousness is like filthy rags in the sight of the Lord. I cannot purify myself. Do you know what it takes to make gold more pure? It's not more gold. It's fire. It's fire. The crucible, the heat, and man, that fire burns those impurities out, doesn't it? And we can skim those impurities off the top, and now we have something more pure. And we let it cool and congeal, and right as it cools and congeals, more nastiness gets on it. And so I put it back in the crucible, and I heat it again, and I scrape off the scum, and now it's even more pure. And the more times it goes through the refiner's fire, the more refined it is, the more valuable it is. Hey, I don't know if you know this, but God invented gold. And it is not an accident that the purification of gold and the sanctification of Christians works in the exact same vein. The fires, folks, the fires and the trials we go through they bring all the scum and the junk to the top, and we get mad at God and say, hey, I didn't know you were going to do that. And God says, I did. Now let's get rid of that scum. Now you're a better person. You're closer to what I want. New fire, new trial, new scum. Oh, I didn't know that. Didn't know I was that person. Right? If you ask me, what is the thing that sets you off the most about your children? If I can be honest with you, it is exactly this. When they act just like my wife. No, me. When they act like me. <laughs> when they act like me. Because nothing disgusts me more than my own imperfections. I don't think I'm alone. And this is why we try to hide our sins. We build pretty little houses around our sin. Don't open that door. Right? I'm sure you've been there. Hey, yeah, come on over to the house. You're welcome to. Just don't touch any of the doorknobs. They're under pressure. It's like when I ask my, my kids, are, is the room clean? Yes, it's clean. And then I always add under the beds, and they go, the floor's clean. Does the floor go under your bed? Sometimes. <laughs> if I were to go up there and look under your bed, what would I find? Stuff. But my sister slash brother put it there. 
my sister slash brother, it's their stuff. My sister slash brother, it's all their fault. Right? None of you have kids like that. I'm the only person in the world who has kids like this. That's who we are. We think if we buy a bed skirt, <laughs> ladies, do not try and lie to me. Don't try and say they're pretty. Don't try and say they're lovely. They're a marvelous accoutrement. No, they hide the stuff under your bed. <laughs> that is the purpose of a bed skirt. We think if we hide it, it's not there. Amen. It is the whole reason that men have to have their own zone so that the wife is, her only requirement is that it has a door. You can have a workshop as long as the doors close. Right? I don't want to go in manland. We make all our own messes. Well, we gotta, I, I might need that later. No, you won't. <laughs> not unless American Pickers is coming by your house. You are not going to need that junk. <laughs> I uh, hate to throw away perfectly good stuff. If it was perfectly good, it wouldn't be in your shop. I'm just saying. Hypocrisy, right? We cannot cover our sins through our good works. It's foolishness. In fact, it leads to decay. It leads to cavities. It leads to death. It makes it worse. The longer I hide my sin inside this little coating that makes it seem like it's okay, the longer I do that, the more I'm destroying my soul. My father had uh, a water meter that the little red knob was spinning. I don't know if you all know what that means, but it means money is actually what it means. And it was spinning even when we turned off the house uh, water, with the water at the edge of the house. We turned it off, the little meter was still a spinning. What does that mean? Oh, we got a leak. Where is that leak? Between the meter and the house. The worst place you can have one. Now, of these 30,000 gallons of water that apparently we had consumed the previous month, not one of those drops was on top of the earth. Are you starting to get nervous for me? Because you should be. Because if all that water that was coming out of the leak wasn't coming up to the surface and going out, guess where it was going? I'll just jump to the conclusion and say the driveway has cracks in it that weren't there before. So here's what we could do. We could ignore that. Just, we could just repave the driveway. Right? And when you came to the house, as long as you didn't drive on the driveway, you'd be like, oh, it looks great. But the longer we ignore it, what's going to happen? The deeper that hole, the more it's going to cost to fix it, the more destruction. That is sin in our lives. It destroys us. Even when we cover it over, it destroys us. He's saying, you can't make, the law is what condemns us. It's what calls us into sin. You can't use the law then to undo the sin. What we have adopted in America is this mentality that if the law convicts us, we'll just change the law. A lot of the argumentation in our media right now is about stuff that is still actually illegal in the state of Georgia. There are laws in the books prohibiting this behavior. We just want to change the laws. That's not convenient anymore. I'm driving my son. My Dylan drove over here today. <laughs> Gets a man right with God to watch his 15-year-old drive across. We drove from 575 down to 75, down to 285, around 285 to 78, which I don't know who did the lanes on 78, but they need a bigger ruler. If it's you, I'm not trying to offend you, but somebody has to tell you. Those lanes are too small for any car. Okay, anyway, drove all the way up 78, and here's the reality. How much of that time was he going exactly the speed limit? Uh. Not one of those stretches of road would be safe at the highway speed limit. Not one stretch of it. And so we all go 70 miles an hour, and we all say, yeah, but everyone else is doing it, and we all feel good about it, but it is absolutely illegal. We are breaking the law, and we are so callous to it that we say as long as we collectively all break the law, they can't pull us all over. 
And then when we get pulled over, we say something like, why didn't you pull them over? Everyone else was speeding. Yes, but I only pulled you over. It's not fair. Amen? It's how we view it. Just change the law. We ought to up the speed limit. Yes, because if we change the speed limit, what would happen? No, no, everyone would drive the same speed. Right? Liar, liar, pants on fire. The law doesn't make it sin. The law just describes it as sin. So therefore, obeying the law can't get rid of sin any more than the law causes the sin. Do you understand that? The law is the diagnosis. I didn't create the sin. I'm just alerting you to the fact this is wrong and bad. I'm alerting you to the fact because I also have the cure. And the cure isn't more law. And by the way, the cure isn't less law. The cure is a righteousness that can only come from the purifying fires of God. Only God can make it hot enough to melt our soul and get rid of the scum. Amen? Is that process painful? As my northerners would say, you betcha. Absolutely. Man, I love it. I love it. Let me just carefully read these last bit and see how he concludes this matter. Verse number 17, But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. People who try to tell me that God's okay with their sin are trying to tell me that God loves sin. And I am here to tell you beyond any shadow of a doubt that God never loves anything that hurts his children. Who among us would? Who among us would love a disease that cripples our children? Who among us would love some sort of sickness that calls our children into pain and sorrow? Who among us would love some kind of disease that causes our children sorrow and anguish and pain and maybe even their lives? None of us! And why are you so consumed telling God to qu quit calling sin, sin? He's trying to tell you the diagnosis so that you can get to a cure. Amen? Is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. Verse number 18, For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law died to the law that I might live to God. Listen to this verse. This is my question. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Why do I love Jesus? Because he didn't diagnose my sin problem. He cured it. Amen? He, he didn't say, hey, buddy, you got a problem. Amen? He cured it. How did he cure it? By paying its price for me. I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It is Jesus alive in me. Verse 21, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. If you can make yourself right, then Jesus made a bad mistake. Why on earth would he have left heaven and come to the earth to die if we could have fixed the sin problem ourselves? Well, if he'd just tell us, oh, yeah, that works well. That works really well, right? Because if someone tells us, we always do what we're told. No. We can't fix the sin problem ourselves. Now, I want to conclude with this matter. First off, let's huddle around the reality that sin is sin because God said so. But it is not a fun stealer. It is a disease preventer. It is not robbing you of joy. It is preserving your joy. 
And God didn't come to condemn you and say, sin is a problem that's going to kill you, too bad. He came to say, if you'd please acknowledge the problem that you have, I have the cure. How committed am I to proving this to you? I'm dying for you. I died. Today I want to ask you this question as the instrumentalists come. Have you been crucified with Christ? Am I willing to surrender my life to him? Am, am I willing...